let me introduce our speakers for this session. We have Dr. Ellen Granger, who is the director of the Office of STEM Teaching Activities here at Florida State. And we have Dr. Dr. Roxanne Hughes, who is the director of the Center for Integrating Research and Learning at the Magnet Lab here at FSU. I'm so glad you both could join us today. Um, I, we have talked already as we were talking about the proposal that a key part of, of the NSF career proposal is that integration of research with teaching. And so I think hearing from the two of you will be extremely helpful for everyone here. So um, Ellen, maybe we could start with you if you would like to start with some comments. Sure, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, and I did post a paper that you can read about undergraduate teaching and evaluating it. Um, Carl Wyman is a Nobel laureate in physics and he visited us a couple of years back. And when he was here, this was one of the things he shared. It's a good place to start because uh, it's specifically about undergraduate teaching. And Carl, while he has a Nobel prize in physics, um, also has made himself a scholar in science education. So uh, he has very good ideas on these. So to go back to that previous conversation about how do you evaluate your teaching, um, you might start by reading that paper um, that I posted in the chat there. Um, aside from that, to think about your broader impact piece um, on, a, on, a, on an NSF grant or even your education piece on a career grant, um, Roxanne and I are, um, do this tag team regularly, <laughs> but we work um, frequently with different people to help them develop their ideas for a broader impact project. Um, we especially work with people who want to um, perhaps address uh, education, K-12 education or adult education or just public outreach in general. I've had um, a lot of different people work with us over the years at um, the Office of STEM Teaching Activities. We have a number of different programs in place already for teachers and students that some people join into. And then we've helped people, and I'll show you a few examples after Roxanne has a chance to, to talk. We've helped people just develop um, ideas that are outside of the outreach programs that we already have in place. So there's a lot of different options for you here. You wanna to add to that, Roxanne? Hi, everyone. Uh, yes, Ellen and I have tag teamed this before and I'm looking through the names. I'm at the Mag Lab. So any of you who are affiliated with the Mag Lab, usually folks will reach out to one or one or the other of us and then we'll direct them back to the other, uh, the other person. Um, but yeah, you are covered if you are in the College of Arts and Sciences by Ellen and her amazing team, and then at the Mag Lab um, with my team. Um, and the only other piece that I was gonna add, Ellen, before you give your examples, uh, the Center for the Advancement um, of Teaching that Beth already mentioned, Leslie Richardson in that um, center is amazing to reach out to. Um, Ellen and I will also, it's not that we don't, want to help you, it's often we'll we know all of the connections across campus for you to, to work with. Um, and I'll talk, Ellen, after you give your examples, I'll give a couple of examples too of um, like WFSU and some other opportunities um, for folks to, to work with if, it, if you're thinking of general public outside of education. I did want to add, um, while I while our offices are in arts and sciences, like Roxanne said, even if you're in the social sciences or some other area, we, we often have connections across outside of our areas and can connect you with the appropriate people. As well, any of you who are in the College of Education, we do a lot of partnering on a regular basis. We've been working recently with Dr. Tom Miller and Dr. Olivia Mason. They um, have been doing some work uh, in pitcher plants um, and they wanted to do a lesson for middle and high school teachers and students. So here's just an example. We worked through a detailed lesson plan. This is all the background information that kids need to know before they can work with the pitcher plant system. So we did a whole lesson with a lot of activities on food webs and recycling in the natural world. 
This we've developed PowerPoints for the teachers to use along with this. This contains all of the questioning that a teacher needs to ask their class as they're going through and getting the students to do the sense making. The second lesson, and I'm going to share another screen. Um, the second lesson actually is the one that gets into uh, the uh, pitcher plants as a little model system for harmful algal blooms that we've seen here in Florida. And um, so we worked through uh, with them and have developed that all of that pre-work was bringing the students up to where they could engage in an investigation of harmful algal blooms using this little pitcher plant community that Tom and Olivia study. And if the teachers don't have Tom and Olivia available to bring them pitcher plants, then the students can start at the data analysis where we've had a group of teachers actually do the data analysis here and we can give classes the data. So that's just an example of the kinds of things that we, we can do. Um, if, if that's where your interests lie. Um, our office also has a couple of marine science programs. We have outreach to elementary school classes. We have physical science outreach to K-12 classes. We run teacher professional development workshops across the state of Florida on a regular basis. And you can tie into any of those things um, that you'd like to be involved in. Um, there's others that are um, rather random from time to time. I had somebody who wanted to do public service announcements on the radio, um, you know, kind of like the little um, earth and sky announcements that come up regularly. And we connected them with the people at the radio station to start working through that and also help them work through their scripts so that it was lay person friendly. So those are the kinds of things that we can work with you on. Really the sky's the limit. If you have ideas, we'll help you work with them. Roxanne. All right, I am going to also share my screen. What we're doing here at the uh, Mag Lab, again, very complimentary to Ellen's group. And the one piece that I like to share with our folks that are applying for career grants is you can reach a classroom of students or you can do an event with students, but when you reach out to teachers and do work with teachers, on average, a high school teacher might teach 100 students a year, an elementary school teacher will work with 30 students a year. So there's a lot, of, there's a broad impact when you're working with teachers. And it's year after year after year for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I always make that highlight. I know folks want to get there with the students, but also teachers will help to translate some of that as well. Um, so following up, I added a slide this year because we're in COVID. Um, and what we've learned at the Mag Lab is there's a number of ways that we can conduct our outreach. So I am the director of the Center for Integrating Research and Learning at the Mag Lab, which is basically our education um, arm of the Mag Lab. We also have a public affairs department, which is our public outreach. If you have heard of the Mag Lab Open House, that is not my team that does that. That is our public affairs team, but that is one of our largest uh, large outreach. Uh, we reach um, over 10,000 people um, with that one day event. This year it was done virtually. But this is just kind of showing you some of the web-based and in-person programs that we have offered, particularly in this past year. Um, tours, virtual field trips, interviews with scientists, demonstrations on our website, lesson plans on our website, games and interactive tutorials. Highly recommend um, looking at our website and going to this one in particular, the Magnet Academy. That's where you'll find the games and interactive tutorials. There was a question about quantitative evaluation and Ellen uh, was able to talk about quantitative evaluating teaching. And you can also do that with, if you do web-based activities, there are a number of ways. And now with COVID, a lot of those have been made uh, cheaper for us to see, but you can look on the back end of visits. Um, you can create a survey to get demographic information if you choose to, but there are a number of ways now to assess um, user and engagement with activities. Uh, we did a summer exploration series this past summer that was completely online, in, which replaced our summer camps that we usually run. 
And our evaluation, uh, our internal evaluator did an excellent report, which I'd be willing to share if you wanna see examples of that. So when I say this, as I go through, I have full-time staff doing the evaluation of our program. So we're able to consult, but we're not able to do the evaluation for your programs, but we can absolutely talk to you about what those look like, share some of our best practices. But I always like to do that upfront because I never want a, a career applicant to be disappointed uh, because I overpromised mine or my, my folks time with that. Um, this just introduces you. I have a team of three right now, and we are in the process of hiring a mentoring director. Um, I, I believe Beth also mentioned the mentoring academy out of the faculty development office. Um, we are also seeing the importance of mentoring, and there are ways that you can assess mentoring. Um, Simmer, the center, um, it's out of University of Wisconsin. I can't think of the full name, but it's on mentoring experiences and they've developed a number of ways that you can evaluate uh, mentoring. And mentoring is also uh, one of the ways that we're seeing how we can increase um, the representation of marginalized groups, uh, particularly in STEM, but across, um, and that's both informal and formal mentoring. So in Searle, and at the Mag Lab, we have undergraduate programs as well as our graduate students, postdocs, and early career faculty. So um, you'll you'll probably have noticed if you um, have postdocs on your grant, you have to have a postdoc mentoring plan. And I I, I mean I I don't have a a, a magic you know uh, way to look into this, but I feel like mentoring will become even more important across all um, folks on a on a grant, including the career grant beyond postdocs. Um, I'm not going to go through these. I'm happy to share them, but these really identify our various programs. So um, like Ellen's group, we also um, conduct outreach in schools. We've been trying to bring more of our um, school-based trips to the Mag Lab so they can really experience um, what the Mag Lab is. It's this gem and it's hard to really understand the immensity and what magnets are um, if they can't come. Um, but we look at, um, we also do middle school is the age group that we, we have a smaller team. So we focus on middle school for a lot of our programs because that's the age in science where we start to see girls especially lose interest in STEM and we want to maintain that interest so that they'll go on to pursue the, um, or take the classes that they need to in order to major in STEM in college. So we have a middle school mentorship program. It's a nice compliment. Ellen's group has a high school program, the Youth Scholars Program. Did I say that correctly, Ellen? Young Scholars. Mm -hmm. Young Scholars. Young Scholars Program, which is an immersion experience in the summer for um, high school students. Um, and then we have middle school summer camps that we run. And Ellen's group also has summer camps um, that these are all like very complimentary of each other. And we... Um, for, for our programs, because my research interest is STEM identity, most of our programs are looking at how we can increase participants' sense of belonging in STEM, even at that early age of middle school. So this gives you an idea for the evaluation of our programs, what we're looking at in terms of performance indicators, as well as metrics that we're looking at. We use pre and post surveys with quantitative and qualitative questions. Folks who have applied for career grants before, we're happy to share our reports and our surveys if you wanna use them. And oftentimes they'll get an undergraduate or maybe a graduate student to help with the evaluation of the project. Um, there are a number of um, graduate students in the College of Ed in our program evaluation uh, courses. So there are opportunities for that and we can connect you to folks to do that work for you. Um, but you can assess if your program or your intervention, which is a very educational word, but if it's a summer camp, the intervention you're planning um, has on your participants. Um, and then these are some examples of our programs for adults, like our research experience for undergraduate program. And we also have a research experience for teachers program. Um, a number of not career grants, but other single PI grants um, that FSU has received. Those folks have included RE or RET programs. So you'll see across campus that we have a number of um, small uh, versions of RU and RET. Sometimes we'll come together. But these programs are more than just the um, 
immersion of participants in the research endeavor. They also include for the undergraduates, there's professional de development and career planning sessions. For the teachers, there's pedagogical sessions on how can you then take what you learn in the lab and incorporate that into your science teaching. Um, and we also have pre-post surveys with those programs as well as um, quant qualitative questions that we ask. We're also beginning to focus more on the mentoring experience. So what works for the mentors? How do they see mentoring as part of a kind of um, orientation into the field for each of the various levels that they're mentoring? Um, and I, there's also some research studies that come out of our program. Ellen and I have also been on some um, studies together, but if you're interested in those, please, you can email me or you can just go to the MagLab website. Uh, I am the only Roxanne at the MagLab. So when you search that, you'll see my page come up with publications. Um, and like I've said before, we are always happy to consult. I can always direct you to the right person, but I will say, um, if it's, you know, two weeks before the career grant is due, I most likely cannot help it at that point. And that's usually in the summer when we're really busy. So if you can get in touch with me, like before the end of May, I am usually in a moment where I'm like happy to help. But then if it's, you know, June, late June or July, I may, it may be a while before I can get back to you with emails because our programs are in full support. So, um, you know, preparation, preparation, preparation. <laughs> I noticed that um, Rachel from my office put put in the uh, chat a link to our Research Mentor Academy. I believe we just completed our first cohort uh, in that academy. And so uh, if you want to look more into that, that's available over in the chat. I also put our website in the chat for people, um, you can go there and it goes through all the different programs um, that we have that are kind of standing programs that we offer all the time. There might be something there that you'd like to connect to, but as I said, when I was showing you the work that we've been doing with um, Tom and Olivia, we're happy to design new things. The nice thing about the designing of new things, um, once we're like we're currently field testing those uh, materials that I shared with teachers and once we finish field testing collecting uh, feedback from the teachers and revising them then it's always a possibility if you're interested um, we're going to be looking at maybe publishing them in something like the science teacher or the biology teacher and then that's a great resource for you to have when you apply for future grants, you have this history of developing something for your broader impact, for your education piece that you can show a history of publication on too. Those are the journals that I mentioned are teacher practitioner journals where teachers go to find things like this. My, my area of real expertise where I have focused most of my research is in teacher professional development. So um, if you want to work with teachers and, and think about what's, um, what are ways that you can integrate your research into thinking about how to help teachers develop professionally, uh, I'm happy to connect you with um, the, the grant work that's ongoing here at FSU along those lines. The resources that you both provide are so helpful for faculty. You know, this is an area that isn't naturally you know part of teaching and research but is, is integral to teaching and research so um i just want to thank you both um christian hubicki writes uh, do you provide connections to the local community schools mm -hmm. yeah so local schools and statewide schools because um and i think roxanne can say the same we we not only work with all the local schools and local teachers but we have um, connections throughout the state and have worked with a lot of people throughout the state. So, you know, if you, um, sometimes people's research takes them to a different part of the state and they want to do something there, that's a possibility. Or um, I noticed on, um, uh, Roxanne was showing up the MagLab's connection with the UF and the UF has a, a scientist in the classroom program that we can connect you with. Mm -hmm. um, there's 
um, lots of interesting things. And as she mentioned, some new things have popped up as we've adjusted to doing outreach during COVID. Um, there's pieces that will remain in the future um, once we even go back to our face-to-face -face pieces. That's a really good point that I hadn't really thought about. We've done workshops in the past with uh, Gadsden, Jefferson, and Wakulla County Schools. And um, this new ability, you know, I think we've had Zoom for years, but actually using this as an education tool opens up a whole host of new things. Um, of, of things that we can do, you know, to outreach that we maybe didn't think about before or maybe wouldn't have seemed feasible. It's funny how things don't seem feasible until you have to do them and then you realize, wow, this is, this is actually, this works. So um, I'm glad you mentioned that because that is very important. And to that question, um, if you're if you want to work with schools, that's also something you need to start. You need to make those connections early on because there might be some technology that you need to add to your grant. So we all have access to computers, but you might need to buy uh, pieces for the classrooms that you choose to work with or if there's manipulatives or you know, if you're doing robotics or something like that, um, it's really, it's really good to get a connection with that teacher early on and to say, here's what I can provide to you. Um, so you're not just asking them to do work for you, but there's budget involved in this. And that usually is really um, receptive. Teachers are really receptive to doing that. Ellen already mentioned this. They are, the teachers are very overwhelmed um, at the end of COVID. So if you don't hear back right away, um, do not, you know, like be persistent in a kind way, but um, most of the connections we've made for our scientists with teachers have worked out really, really well, um, but they tend, you know, they're not going to check their email in June necessarily, so uh, because they might go on vacation, so definitely reaching out to those folks early on. The school system has bought Chromebooks for every teacher and for every student now. They are very limited in what they can do. I think Chromebooks are great because they're cheap, but uh, what teachers have found is just like even some of the features that come along with Zoom, um, they have like whiteboards and things like that. They have a hard time using on a Chromebook. So um, her point of, even though you might've heard that all students have a laptop now, um, the uh, Roxanne's point of you may still need to buy <laughs> technology for them to be able to do what you want to do is well taken. I also, um, her point of work connecting early if you want to work in schools, at, at a minimum, minimum, you're going to have to get a uh, volunteer background check to work with people in schools. That's a very low level one, but if you want to do more intensive work in schools, you'll need to get a full background check and that takes some time. Um, and just because you had one at FSU does not mean it translates to the school system. Uh, the systems don't talk to each other and you do have to background check through the school system. So um, that's something else to think about. And with respect to the girls coding, um, we uh, have uh, made a connection um, in our office. And I know Roxanne does some work with um, girls coding as well that I'll let her talk about, but uh, we have a graduate student from the computational sciences department who's a real go-getter and she um, has connected with uh, my office and is working with a person in my office to offer coding camps. Um, and we, we canceled them last summer, which was gonna be their first summer because it just, everything came upon too fast. Um, but they will be offered this summer, either uh, remotely or possibly in person towards the end of the summer. They're one week camps, but yeah, we do things with coding and we can connect you in with girls coding. And Roxanne, I think you have connections with the National Girls Coding Group, right? Yeah, so uh, we have connections with Sci Girls, the national um, organization. We have Sci Girls Camp, and then um, Dr. Lee, I see that you put our Sci Girls Coding Camp. So that's been in existence, I believe, for four or five years now, and that's a one week camp. We've expanded it, and we're going to hold one week of the camp at um, FAMU DRS. Um, which is the feeder school to FAMU, like FSU has um, FSU schools. 
Um, but coding, like Ellen said, uh, there is a real um, demand for coding um, and for coding camps. So I think that there will become, there'll become more of a demand in terms, Dr. Lee, of how can you help? If you want to email me, it might not be for the career grant, but if you want to email me, I'll connect you with Carlos Villa, who um, oversees our camps. And we usually have opportunities for role models to talk about what they do um, as it relates to coding or in our Sci Girls program, the same thing, our scientists. Um, so this is, this is relevant to the entire group. If there's an activity that you want to pilot, let's say, you can always practice it if you contact me um, or Carlos, and we're usually happy to depend, like ha work with you on the activity. And then it could be an hour long, a half day. We've had folks develop a whole day. We'll kind of tell you if we think it's getting too in the weeds with the students, but a number of our folks and some career grant recipients have practiced an activity um, in our camps with the, with the students. And then we have, we can show them the, the um, evaluation results and they can use those results to write a career grant or any other grant. So there are kind of test beds for it, but we would help you with that. And of course, we're planning those activities now for the summer. So again, the earlier you can get involved in those, the more likely you'll have to, to do that this summer, but we're happy to test those out um, in other capacities. And also to give you just, sometimes folks will contact me and ask what our, um, ask just what the cost of a camp is to put that into the grant so that you have a sense and we can easily send you our budget um, and what the cost and logistics of that is too. So you can add that right into your grant. Faculty who don't do education or don't do outreach are super stressed because they're like, I have to develop an entire module. And I hope that you feel a little bit more relaxed in hearing that there are people that can either help you with that or connect you to that. So you don't have to develop an entire we knew course, you will have people to help you. And you don't have to be the expert on evaluating that course. There are people to help you across campus or guide you in that. Um, so just you know, realize that your focus is on your expertise for this and there are folks um, at FSU that can help with the other pieces. Yes, and nailing that down early and not at the last minute. <laughs> Very important. I think I think that was mentioned, but I just wanted to emphasize that the, this isn't this isn't last minute stuff. You need to catch at the end. Go ahead and, and figure these things out early, so you know what direction you're going you're going in. So when you get to that part, you can think through. And even as you're doing writing the research component, you're thinking through how all of this is going to fit together. So have those conversations early, um, early and often, right? So. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Roxanne, both so much for being with us this afternoon, for this great information, for the links, for your email. Uh, I am sure you will hear from a number of people. <laughs>